Dismiss the children. And we're on number 17 on religion or Christianity. Before we get going, let's take a, a moment of uh, silent prayer, and we take advantage of that because we know that as believers we're very capable of sin, and uh, thankfully God gives us an option to get back in uh, the filling of the Holy Spirit and able to learn and grow. So uh, let's go ahead and take a minute, and we'll, we'll do that, and then we'll, we'll get going. Let's pray. Dear Father, we thank you so much for uh, just each and every moment that we have uh, on this earth. Uh, we're, we're becoming more and more aware of the grace that you provide us, and we just thank you. And we ask tonight for the concentration necessary uh, to make a change in our thought process, and just uh, ask that you uh, be glorified through our life. We ask all these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Here we are, number 17, and uh, if you remember, we left off talking about uh, biblical Christianity uh, in, in relation to re religion, and who was showing us that was Paul. He had a very good picture of what that looked like in a few different places. One of those was Philippians we were looking at, and uh, one of the things that we saw was the opposition of religion to grace. And uh, we looked at various aspects of it, but we saw that, you know, some of some people may have looked a little confused when I said that. But the reason why that's kind of a, a foreign concept is because there's so many churches that use the word grace. They throw it around. They'll even teach about it. They talk about it. Uh, they use it in their everyday conversation. So to us, we hear those things and we think, well, they must know what grace is all about and they must, you know, live a grace-oriented life. Uh, but that's not the case because we can see here, at least from the Bible's examples, that religion doesn't like grace. It's, remember, it's free. It's nothing that we can do for it and therefore religion opposes that or even we oppose that because we have a sin nature as well. And we have to go against that grain and the only way to do that is to receive truth because we are all <laughs> capable of going in that direction or thinking more in line with that, uh, you know, that religious thought process. And we, we can get ourselves into trouble sometimes. So I'm not saying we're immune to that. But what I am saying is that when we get into that thinking or uh, when we see it in Scripture, it is opposed to it. And I think Paul showed us that. But you can see that what we see, at least today, is we see that the word gets redefined. When someone says grace to you or when someone talks about God giving us grace, it's not necessarily the definition, the biblical definition of grace. It's not necessarily what we learn as undeserved favor from God based on the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. That's what we view grace as because that's how God defined it in the Bible, at least from, a, uh, uh, from our standpoint of viewing the verses that talk about grace. So, and we should know that by now, that when someone redefines a word, the new meaning of the word, as far, at least as far as man is concerned, takes away the focus off God and it puts it on man. And it's no different with grace. Uh, we could see that over and over. Remember, we looked at a couple of examples. One of them was eternal security. And the other one was uh, just a uh, free uh, grace-based salvation. Both of those concepts are rooted in grace. Not only the giving of salvation, of letting us in God's plan, but also the keeping us there is both based on God. They're not based on what we can do. Uh, do you have to make a decision in that process? Yes. Uh, God gives us that ability to choose for Him, and I'm calling that faith. We choose, we accept, we believe, right? That gets us in the plan, and guess what? That also keeps us in the plan. 
once saved, always saved, but after you're saved, you have a lot of decisions to make that are and should be by faith. So the initial decision to get in the plan was by faith, and every decision after that is always by faith. We don't think about it a lot like that, but every moment in every part of the Christian life, whether it be confession, whether it be applying something that we learned, everything, passing a people test is all done by faith, every single bit of it. So that's what we're talking about when we say biblical Christianity. It's rooted in faith. It's rooted in the grace of God, because if it's not, how are we going to be able to take that grace and reflect it back to people around us? We can't do it. And then that, that's uh, what we define as no change, no heart change, no soul, no life change. And so, what, you know, what, what are you here for right at that point? So, um, so. To show you what I mean, I, I got this from a, uh, a Baptist church, and it's called God's Purpose for Grace. You know, that sounds great. I mean, I, I was interested in reading this myself. I think this is Southern Baptist, but it doesn't really matter on which one it is. I just wanted to show you the wording here because this is the kind of thing I'm talking about. Because if we're going to teach it, if we're going to look at it, if we're going to use the Word, we need to see what's not accurate as far as the Word of God is concerned. So here's, here's the statement. It says, election is the gracious purpose of God according to which He regenerates, justifies, sanctifies, and glorifies sinners. All true believers endure to the end. Those whom God has accepted in Christ and sanctified by His Spirit will never fall away from the state of grace, but shall persevere to the end. Now your little alerters should have went off at some point in there, right? You know, that first sentence, it doesn't bother me. There, I don't think there's anything necessarily wrong with that first sentence. We can pick it apart, but I think it's biblical. You see where the problem comes in is after the dot, dot, dot. All true believers endure to the end, right? That, that's where the problem comes in. Now, I'll tell you, to try to figure out what that means is impossible. And the reason it's impossible is because the Bible never uses this phrase in conjunction with salvation. It does use that phrase, but it doesn't use it in the way they're using it. So to me, that's confusing. That's confusing. When I say every true believer endures to the end, well, guess what? You're thinking of, well, what does endure mean? And have I done it? That's the real focus, at least according to this. So in my mind, I would be a little concerned with you know, maybe sinning, <laughs> you know, that, that could have be a cause and effect when it comes to endurance in, I'm assuming they're talking about in the believer's life. So, so you see, that's where the initial conflict comes in here with the Bible, where it says all true believers um, endure to the end. The next part you see is they will never fall away from the state of grace. Now, I don't know what that means. Um, I know where they got it, but I don't know. They're using it in, 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 in a way that is foreign to me. And the next one is, per, will pers shall persevere to the end. Now, that's kind of a rephrase of endure to the end, right? Same kind of, kind of language, persevere and endure. I take those as synonymous in meaning. But this, I just want to show you, this is a classic example of a perseverance of the saints model. You've all heard that. You've all, we've talked about it, but this is it right here. This is the definition of that. And what happened, well, just take the, the first phrase right here. Like I said, for starters, there's no verse in the Bible that uh, includes this and salvation in one thought. The next problem is, of course, they don't use the list of Bible, Bible verse, and that's for a very specific reason, right? Um, 
And what I notice that is when I go to find these phrases in the Bible, because some of these are from the these these three letter or word phrases are from places that you they ring a bell. They something in your head goes off because I've heard that verse or that's from somewhere, like endure to the end. Uh, so I go to look these up, you know, and, and I'm finding that it absolutely is detached from any context that is available. So let's not forget, we have specific real, not only real world, but real Bible, which is real world, examples showing us who did not endure to the end. Last I checked, we have the fleshly and carnal Corinthians. Well, they surely didn't endure to the end. Uh, they gave up multiple times. And actually, they stayed uh, not enduring for a, an extended period of time in their life. So are they excluded from this calculation here, right? I would say yes, according to this, right? According to this. Um, what about the thief on the cross? I would say he didn't endure till the end. He didn't have any time to endure. What he, did, what he did have time for was to believe in Jesus. That's what he had. No endurance. Actually, he did just the opposite. He rejected Jesus his entire life. And then he accepted at the very end. Um, I think there's a very specific reason why God gave us that example in the Bible. You know, even though that is not what God desires for every believer on exactly how to live the spiritual life, obviously... It just shows you that grace is what saves us. That's why the example's there. God didn't want everybody to go their whole life and then all of a sudden b believe and die, everybody in the Bible, because guess what? There's a spiritual life to live. There is a responsibility for you and I and, and all believers to, to live, right? So, and according to this, this statement, when I look at my own life, um, I mean, as a, as a baby believer, I can, I'm sure you can relate, there was sure a lot of quenching and grieving the Spirit, and I can definitely tell you I was not enduring to the end at that moment in my life, and many moments in my life. So according to this, I would look at this and say, well, I was not a true believer at that time in my life, but that's not accurate. Because I know for a fact that I accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. I'm old enough at that point to realize it actually happened much longer before that point, right? So, so that's a, that's a, that's a, brings up, there's just so many questions, right? And don't forget about what this teaching does to people when they buy into it. Remember that. This is an important point because you're in the world and these are the kind of people that have, are in the world with you and that you are around all the time and associate with. These are our good friends. These are people we love and enjoy and spend time with. Nothing wrong with the, them, but I'm telling you there's something wrong with this doctrine, with this truth. So I think we're part of the process to alleviate some of that to clear up some things, to shine a little bit of light on the subject, right? So what this does is it gives people a false hope. Remember that? We said that a long time ago. Because their expectations are on their own performance, and those expectations of their performance are unrealistic and impossible. This is impossible. Remember we talked a little bit about that a while back. Enduring to the end makes absolutely no sense when we're talking about salvation. You've got a sin nature. You can't get rid of that sin nature. So, and there will be times in your life where you will stay out of fellowship with God for an extended period of time, right? So, what that tells me is that this definition is in left, not only in left field, it's got a problem when it comes to explaining it to other people, right? Um, and, and of course the problem here is that it contradicts scripture as I already mentioned and they can't define really what endure or persevere mean why? because the Bible doesn't define it in relation to salvation it may define it in your Christian life 
But when it comes to asking them, what does endurance mean? And, and how much do I need to endure before I lose my salvation? Can't answer it. There's no answer for that. It's open-ended. But I can give you an answer based on what I think. If you do this, 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 and this maybe, or if you stay out of fellowship for this long, see how it's all relative. It's based on what I think you should be doing, right? So, and then here's the, the second part of this. Uh, and sanctified by His, His Spirit, or sorry, uh, will never fall away from, from the state of grace, uh, but shall persevere to the end. Now you see this never fall away uh, from grace. This is interesting because what they did was they tied the grace of God to works in, in one, basically one phrase. Now you know the easiest way to get a lie over on somebody is you mix the truth and the lie. This is it right here. They're mixing works and grace in one sentence, in one swoop, and they're sh shoveling it, spoon-feeding it to whoever will come by and just say, hmm, that looks good. Now, I'm not saying they're thinking this as they're teaching it, because I, th I do think there's a lot of un people that are unaware of the things that they're involved in. I'm not, I'm not focused on the people here. What I'm telling you is that Satan is very aware of what's happening here. So they're talking out of both sides of their mouth, right? And, and you have to do that. Remember, you have to talk out of both sides of your mouth. If I'm going to teach something and it's not true, I have to talk out of both sides of my mouth to try to justify. I have to. In order to give you any kind of legitimate evidence, I have to include some truth. I've got to do that. Or else you'd be like, you're, you're, you're crazy, right? So... Well, there you go. There's, there's a good mixture right here. And, and you know, it, it's, it's that oil and water concept. They're opposed. They're, they're excluded, right? When, when, if it's works, guess what? There's a verse that tells us it's no longer grace. This is t combining them right here. It's combining them. When we have Scripture, that says the, the other way. Now, of course, you know, when you see these things, you think of other Scripture. And you, when you hear that never fall away from the state of grace... That's actually from Galatians 5.4. But it's taken out of context again, because this eternal security or salvation is not what Paul is talking about in Galatians 5.4. I can assure you. And, and we'll look at that, because what I want to do at the end of this uh, uh, study is take all these hard, not hard, but maybe challenging verses that the opposition uses against you to justify their positions. And I want to work through some of those to show everybody that these verses are not intimidating. They're not scary. Even though sometimes when you see a verse, you say, whoa, that, man, that looks like they are correct. Many times you look at a verse and say, man, that doesn't look right. We'll include the context. We'll look at the Greek or the Hebrew, and we'll look at it, and it'll fall like dominoes. It becomes so clear when you just do a little bit of dissection on these things. But, you know, that's how it goes every time, it seems like. So, and that's why we're saying why I think I can safely say religion is opposed to grace. This statement right here is opposed to grace. If it's claiming that works are in accordance, they go together, works and grace, no, they're excluded. They're, they're, they're opposites. And just like the description of grace you heard earlier, it actually perverts uh, grace. So, uh, and anyways, we saw that opposition in the religious Jews here that Paul was talking about. And that the verse we actually left off with is in John 10. Remember their reaction? That after Jesus was speaking, what did they do? They reacted. They picked up the stones to stone him because, well, he said a lot of things, but the reality was he didn't say anything wrong. He was speaking what? Truth. And what does truth do? It gets a reaction. It gets a reaction many times. It, it gets us to react. It's got so much of an effect, even a believer that is positive, it, it can get us to react. I mean, that's just the word. That's the power of the, the word of God, right? So... 
So when grace is removed from the gift, guess what? It's no longer a gift. It's no longer a gift. And when that happens, when it's no longer a gift, it's also no longer salvation. It's no longer salvation. It's been repackaged to be something else. But I can tell you it's not biblical salvation. Think about that. That's a scary thought. Because there's a lot of people that are buying into these kind of things right here that I'm telling you this is not salvation that is from God. And if I believe this, that concerns me about many, 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 many people in my periphery. Many. Maybe that's a conversation to have with someone, you know? If you're concerned about your best friend or some people that you love, maybe just talk about this one subject. It doesn't have to be this specific phrase. It could be one Bible verse. It could be about grace. What's your view on grace? How do you feel about grace? What do you, how, do you, how does your church define it? And, and, you know, what is it, right? So you also saw um, that actually when you place any requirement on salvation, uh, the saving aspect is removed. The saving. I don't, I don't care how small, how, how narrow, how wide it is. When we, re when we place a requirement outside of faith on salvation, it removes the saving effect of salvation. Because the requirement has not been met. God doesn't say this and this. He says this, which is faith. We can't add. We can't add anything. And I'm speaking to you like that clearly because you can understand that. Do a lot of things come in our mind when I say we can't add anything? Of course. The world will add a lot of things to your mind when it comes to free, the freeness of grace. But don't ever forget that there is a positional and an experiential sanctification in the believer's life. We have to be positionally sanctified before we can even live the spiritual life. So don't mistake the requirements or the responsibility and put it before the positional sanctification. You just can't do that. That's why God has to start you off with faith and keep you with faith because we don't have anything to offer in His plan without Him. You've got to rely on Him all the time. And He made sure that by uh, this, this requirement of faith. So... We saw that opposition, we saw that reaction, and we saw how they remove the grace out of it and also remove the saving aspect right out of salvation. So, uh, anyways, to distort grace at salvation, I think, has at least two major problems. Of course, the, the major problem is that it keeps one from being saved. That's the major, the, the hardest one to deal with. That's the, the blow, right? But the other thing it does is that let's say they were saved. They did believe by faith alone. But then they switch over to, and we're going to see this, because Paul has some good examples of people that were saved, and then they switched over to this kind of system right here. And he even very clearly says that. But what is that doing now? Did they lose their salvation? No, of course not. They believed. They believed. But now they're in some religious system of good works. Or they're basing something off something that they shouldn't, and they've excluded grace. So what does that mean for them? Well, they're going to show up just as one that has been snatched from the fire. You know that verse that says we show up empty-handed, no good works? It doesn't say that you're going to the eternal lake of fire. It just says that you won't have anything to show for your Christian life. And we want to have something to show for. That's what good works are all about. That distinguishes people in heaven, and I say it distinguishes people on this earth. And, and how happy you are in your personal life, in the blessings that God gives you as an individual believer that is worshiping Him, right? So look at this. Paul explains this as a different gospel in Galatians 1.6. He says, I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is not another 
Only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. Now, keep in mind, Paul had preached to the Galatians the right gospel. He preached a grace-based gospel. He's very clear about that in his, in his, in his books, right? He's, he's very grace-oriented and absolutely faith alone in Christ alone. I mean, Ephesians 2, 8, 9 is Paul. So he, he preached the right one, but what is he telling us? He's saying that they were being influenced by religion around them, and it was causing a problem in their own thinking. That's why he says, I am amazed. He was astonished that they were being influenced by something that they weren't preached to, because they preached the God, Paul preached the gospel to them. But now they were going to this definition that we just saw in this denominational religious stuff, and they were, that's what they were, were, were working on with people. It was influencing them. It was having an impact. And that tells me it can have an impact on us. It can. It can have an impact on us. We all have our own feelings, our own desires. We all have sin natures. And then you add other people around you that most of them are not in doctrinal churches. You got a, a combination for a problem. And it may not be a big problem, but it can be a problem in a sense that it may influence you when it comes to explaining something or helping someone uh, with salvation. So, but Paul is saying there is no other gospel. That's what he said. He says, which is not another. In other words, there's no other one. You, you can try to preach another one, but there's only one. There's not another one. There's just one. So what does that mean? Well, there can be a different uh, false one, I guess we could say, right? So, and, and it's clear right here that the pressure was coming from outside the church. If you read the personal pronouns, the way Paul is talking about P, people, the second to the third person, it's coming from outside the influence to the inside of the church. And that's usually how it happens. Because, you know, like I said, we're, we're, we're vulnerable too, but that's why we always have to stay, I guess we could say, on top of our game when it comes to the intake of the Word, the intake of truth. That has to be consistent. If we're not at the top of our game, if we're not in spiritual shape, guess what we are? We're more prone to being accepting of a different viewpoint that is not absolute authority of the Word of God. And that's dangerous, right? I mean, we all know we've all been in a position where we maybe did go down that road for, for a short time. And it's dangerous. It, the results are not good. But look at this word distort here. Um, this is what was happening. And this is an interesting word because it's only used two other times in Scripture. I thought that, you know, when you, you see something like that, you go, okay, well, let's look at those other two examples. I, I want to see what they were, right? The first one was in Acts 2.20 is the other example. This is where Paul is, is referencing a prophecy from Joel 2.28. And he describes the sun turned to darkness. Same word right there, turned distort here. You, you say something's changing. The sun changed to darkness. Or you could say, I guess the sun distorted to darkness, but it, you get the idea. I'm trying to show you something went from something to something else. You got that. And the other reference is in James 4, 9, where he gives a command to let your laughter be turned into mourning. What's interesting is that in both of those examples, something changed to something that it wasn't. It changed from something, it went to a completely different form. And I, I thought it was interesting, the sun turned to darkness. Well, in this example, they were turning light into darkness by changing the gospel from light, from truth, to something else, which we're saying is darkness. Anything but truth is dark. Right? It's, if it's not true, it's darkness. It's from Satan. Or at least Satan promoted. We all know we have our own abilities to be influenced by evil. It's not all Satan's fault. We have an individual uh, decision maker here, right? We can influence ourselves and be involved with evil. Um, and that's the way it goes. So to distort 
change or pervert the gospel is to make it something other than it originally was. In other words, from here to here, it's now unrecognizable. So if I were to preach to you this distorted gospel as kind of what we looked at, that perseverance model, that is something different. It's not from God. And Paul talks about the word or the gospel not being from man, but from God. There's a reason why he was talking with that language. Because everybody was preaching the gospel as if it was from man. It's not from us. It was given to us by the revelation of God Himself. And so we have to take it and pass it. We can't take it, turn it, change it, distort it, and then pass it. I'm thinking of you know, a Rubik's Cube in my mind. We can't do that with it, <laughs> right? Some of you can probably do that behind your back or something. <laughs> I always wanted to see somebody do that in real life, right? Um, so. We don't want to do the Rubik's Cube with the gospel, but that's what so many people do. That's what so many people do. So, um, and it's different, right? And what happens with a different gospel is what? Well, you lose its effectiveness. That's number one. The saving aspect is gone. It's lost its power. It's lost its everything that the original, it's lost its changing, transforming effect. It's lost its, you know, regeneration by the Holy Spirit. Everything is just gone because we've taken it, we've changed it, and now it's something else. Light to darkness. All change. And then look at uh, verse 8. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. As we have said before, so I say again, now if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you have you received, he is to be accursed. Isn't that interesting? Paul's repeating himself. See? I'm getting it from Scripture. <laughs> you can't be too mad at me. Paul did it back to back. I do that sometimes too. So, I mean, and it's clear to me, right? It's basically telling us that for all the people out there that are preaching this are to be accursed. That's the, the result, the effects of taking something that's from God and changing it to make it our personal own and then regurgitating. Accursed. That's, that doesn't sound very comfortable. And here's another thing I wanted to show you that Paul is describing all this. We're talking about removing things out of God's uh, way, removing grace, removing the freeness of it. Paul calls this nullifying the grace of God. And if you go down to Galatians 2.20, uh, at least that's the beginning where I want to start, and we'll make our way to that verse. Here's what 2.20 says. It says, and this is a good start. It says, I've been crucified with Christ, and it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live... In the flesh I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. What a great verse. What a great verse that takes the focus off of us and it completely and totally points to Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross. Not just that salvation. Paul's talking about day-to-day -day life. He's not talking about enduring to the end. He said, it is no longer I who live but Christ who lives in me. Guess what perseverance does? It excludes that. But they'll tell you that's included in that too. Well, no. If it includes you enduring to the end, where does Christ fit in that? This is reliance on Christ by faith, excluding man's works. You realize life is a lot easier when you let God do the work? A whole lot easier when you let God work in whatever area of life that seems to be tough? Christ does live in you. Remember that. And when we do things that God has specified in His Word, manage of sin through confession, continuing in His Word, guess what? That's love. Did you realize that you are in a loving relationship with God and you are growing in that love? We are getting to know Him more and more and more, and that's worship. 
That's worship because we love the person and the work and the God that we are studying and we're only finding more and more out. It's exciting because there's no person on this earth that you're going to hear about like this, right? Or you will, but it's going to be a false Christ or antichrist, right? So, so this is what Paul is talking about and I, I wanted to include this verse because you can understand where he's coming from. There was a lot of people putting the focus on themselves and doing it on their own, and they were the ones that were so holy because they worked so hard. See the difference? Paul's taking all that and he's saying, nah, -uh, it's not even me. He's saying, I was, I've been crucified with Christ. What does that mean? Well, there's your believer that understands eternal security. That's the believer who is faithful, devoted, and fully trusting every day of his life to Jesus Christ, who is his Savior and his God, right? So, and then he says, the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith. I live by faith. That's the statement that's calling everybody out and saying, it's not by the effort it's not even by the self-discipline. Remember, that's a fruit of the Spirit. It's not by something that you can conjure up even if you work hard at it. Nothing. It's by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. There's grace again. He goes right back to grace. He's saying, remember, he started, he loved you first, and he went a step further and gave himself up for us. That's sacrifice. That's the ultimate sacrifice right there. For someone to love you first and then go a million times further and sacrifice themselves for you. Unbelievable, right? We wouldn't do it. We can't do it. We're incapable of doing that. We have a sin nature. So, and we know that faith is what pleases God. That's why Paul points it out right here. So, to say that we live our life by faith in the Son of God is to say, I think, that you're living under His will for your life. And that happens through faith, by trusting in Him. Remember, there's always two wills. We want to do something and God wants you to do something. Easy way to look at it. Which one do you do? That's where the real sacrifice comes in. That's where the real perseverance comes in. You know, we can really go the opposite direction on that and say, well, this is what I want to do. There's a lot of things and desires that we have as individuals, but God knows absolutely what you need and where you need to be at the end of that need. He sees the road. He sees the, you know, the light at the end of the tunnel as I look at the spotlights at the end of the aisle here. He knows. He, he can see it. So when we get outside of that, guess what you lose? The light at the end of that tunnel. He is the light. And that's the only thing that illuminates the path is His Word. That's it. That's the only thing we have to communicate, to, uh, uh, to understand Him, to be able to decipher what is His will for my life. That is it. That, that, that's the only thing that we have. So it's got to be through faith because what are you going to do with these words? Well, they have to be transferred into you, into your soul. That comes through faith. It does. Which is definitely why Paul can say this next statement. He, he, he's qualified to say the next statement. I do not nullify the grace of God. For if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died needlessly. Needlessly. Now this blows, completely blows that God's purpose for grace definition that we looked at earlier. This, this verse, right? well, we've already seen a lot of verses blow it out of the water, but this one surely does. And Paul's given you a clear example of why he does that. Because if righteousness came through the law, by, what, by the way, substitute law for anything that man can come up with. Because what they were doing was taking something that was from God and distorting it. Because the law, you know, sometimes we see the law as a bad thing. The way Scripture uses it, like, well, no, the law is from God. But they were taking it and they were using, distorting it. Well, take religion. What have they done? They've taken the Word of God and they've distorted it. Same thing, right? Well, Paul's saying if righteousness comes through the law, if it comes through religion, if it comes through man, those are all the same thing in this context. 
If it comes through anything other than God, then Christ died needlessly. In other words, what's the point? If you can have input in the plan of God, if you can conjure, if you can originate something that helps God out, what has Christ died for? And it, right here in the context, see what he's talking about? Righteousness. Righteousness. If there is anything in, in God's mind that he thought we could achieve to get this righteousness on our own, he would have he said, go for it. But he didn't. He knew that we could not achieve our own righteousness. But, you know, the, the law is a good example of that. So is religion. But the law is a good example because remember what the Pharisees were doing. They were taking salvation and they were putting the law as a requirement. Well, wait a minute, do you follow the law? It's from God, right? This is, this is all biblical stuff. They were using it wrong. Remember, if it's, if it's not light, it's dark. If it's not light, it's darkness. That's what they were changing right here. So, Paul's calling out the fact, he's calling them out right here, all of them. He's saying the righteous does not come through the law. It doesn't come through a set of moral rules, guidelines, practices, it doesn't, it doesn't even come through fasting. Would you believe that? Fasting doesn't make you any holier than before. It doesn't gain you any more righteousness than before. Guess who does? God. The Holy Spirit gives you more righteousness. His Word gives you more righteousness. Not fasting. I'm not saying there's anything necessarily wrong with fasting. I think everybody should fast every once in a while. It's a good thing. Healthy, right? For you. It's good for your body. But... What are you doing it for? That, that, I think that becomes the real question. Uh, wh what's the purpose, the motivation, right? We can all get into the details of that, but, uh, oh, it's for God all the way. Is it? Or are you trying to gain or work your own righteousness? Wait a minute. Righteousness doesn't come through fasting. It doesn't happen. It comes through Christ. That's where it comes through. So wait a minute. What you're working on... If you truly believed in Christ way back here, you've already got that. You just need to live the spiritual life now. And then that fasting would be, uh, well, if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, it would be uh, approved before God, right? It would bring glory to God if we want to fast, if we do it in a proper way. Nobody wants to hear that, though, nowadays. Because now when they teach how to be righteousness, they teach that it does come through the law. It does come through the church. It does come through the rituals that you can do. It does come through this, 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 baptism, sacraments. It does come from these things. Because guess what? If you don't do them, try them out. Oh, I don't want to do those church. I don't want to do those church rituals. But I'm saved. <laughs> no, you're not. You, you mean to tell me you weren't baptized? You didn't do the sacraments, the seven, all seven? How can you not do all seven of them and be saved? You can't, at least according to that denomination, right? Or eight, nine, whatever is up to now. So this is an interesting word. Nullify. See the word, nullify? The word is atheteo. And it means to do away with what has been established. You know, it's kind of sad to me. Something that's already been given and established and provided, and you're doing away with that. Something that, to do away with something that God's grace has provided, nullify it. It means to regard it as invalid. In other words, not recognize the fact that this has been freely given to you. You know, it's funny because we do that. We do. I'm not talking about salvation now. But, you know, we do that. We don't always recognize the grace in our life. Sometimes we take credit for it. I did it. That, that's mine. I found it. I got it first. Right? Well, think about what's happening in salvation. They are regarding what was already given to them, what was already provided freely, and they're taking credit for it because they're disregarding the grace of God. They're demonstrating that in these rules that we talked about. Another thing it means to nullify is to refuse to recognize the validity of something. 
I can guarantee you God doesn't appreciate that. When we refuse to recognize the validity of anything that He offers us, that has to be a dangerous area. I can't imagine. <clears throat> can you imagine that? Refusing to recognize anything that God has given us. So, <clears throat> man. So, religion does away with what has already been established, and it nullifies it. Does that nullify, does that say that nullifies what God has provided? No. It nullifies what, how it comes out in their life. It, it doesn't change what God has given or what His Word, the effect of His Word. What nullifies is that in their specific personal life, they are not recognizing the grace of God. So, and when people lean on these inferior ways to be righteous or become righteous in God's plan, what are they saying? Christ died needlessly. That's what, that's what it's saying. That's what, that's what it's saying. Because they're not living a life by faith. They're living a life based on credit. So, if we're going to reach people who have been through the ringer on religion and are ready for the truth, we have to understand these, these various nuances where they're coming from. You know, I feel like I keep learning more and more about where people are coming from, what they understand, where the problem may lie in their personal life, and where they're trapped, and why they can't get out. Because it is a system built on top, on top, on top. And when you try to get out of something like this, good luck. You almost have to just disappear and remove all your social media accounts, remove your phone number, change your address. Because they're coming for you, right? They're going to get you. Hopefully not physically. But I think you understand the idea. It's hard to get out of. It's hard to escape. And it's more of a mental thing to escape than anything else. It is. It's very hard. So, you know, we have to know that because guess what's going to help them? Uh... I tell you what's not going to help them is saying commit your life to Jesus and turn from every area of sin in your life. That is not going to help them. Because that's that false hope that I was talking about. That's what preachers are preaching all the time. That's not going to help them. What's going to help them maybe is grace. Is telling them grace, what grace is all about and showing them that, hey, if you want to truly live the spiritual life, you got to live it the way God shows us how to live it, which is not based on what we can do because we can't do anything without Him. It's based on what He has already established. He's already established everything. That, I think that's going to help them. Because guess what? They've already been told everything else. I think people are to the point where they may be searching. They may be doing a little wondering about, is this it? Is this all that God has to offer? No, it's not. Yeah, I mean, is this the spiritual life? No change? I'm dealing with a bunch of hypocrites that go to church and they don't have any change in their life? Is this what God offers people? They're ready for some answers. And a lot of them are, are questioning, leaving. What's interesting is that you see the youth now being detached from the church. And so there's an area of youth out there, 20s, 30s, or, or less, right, that have the parents have been through the ringer with religion, and now they come through and they say, I can see that doesn't work. So they just detach from it all. But they're receptive to the gospel message. They want to hear something that's easy. They want to hear something that's free. And they want to hear how to be saved. It wasn't easy for Jesus Christ. And that's the first thing you can tell them. But the reality is, is that He gave us that salvation because He wanted to. Because He wanted to. And if you're ever wondering about how to be saved, look no further because believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you are saved. You are saved. So... I'm not just saying that's just that area, because everybody needs salvation that doesn't have it, right? Everybody. Everybody. I mean, I think people are receptive at all ages, but I do notice there's quite a few of those 
young ones coming up that are detached from all things. So, um, so Paul is still getting on to these Galatians for wasting their time, basically. Uh, and, and let's see what he says because he's still getting on to them. And it's all too common to have people that are saved yet wasting their time on the big divine picture. That, that's what's happening. That's what's happening. Look at Galatians 3.1. This is, I didn't skip any verses. This is just rolling to chapter 3. It says, You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified? So what he's saying is, which of these religious false teachers has deceived you, non-thinking Galatians, into what you're doing now? That's what the word foolish means. It means without thought. He's telling them they're not thinking. They're not thinking. So I like the word bewitched. It, it, it can mean kind of in a figurative sense, kind of put under a spell. Who's put you under a spell with their religious influence? In other words, they heard it and now it's influencing them and now they're, they're doing things like removing the grace of God out of their messages, which is a different system, right, that God has already provided. Look at verse 2. This is the only thing I want to find out from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? You know what? If they would answer this question correctly, the conversation would have been over. Because if they would have answered this question correctly, I mean, Paul, what Paul had been talking about, he would have justified right here in this question. Where did the Spirit come from? Did it come from some, something you did? Or did it come from faith? Which you know where faith points to, directly to the object of that faith. So where did it come from? Where did that Spirit come from? Because these are believers and he's asking them, where did your spirit come from? They switched over to a different system. He's now he's trying to get them back. Where did you get the Holy Spirit from? It surely wasn't by the works of the law, which you're trying to tell people was a requirement for salvation. It wasn't from that. It wasn't from whatever you can do. It's from hearing with faith. And by the way, he's not putting the focus on the faith. He's putting on the focus on the object of that faith. Faith always has an object. Without an object, what is faith? It's not. It's not faith, right? So that's verse 2. And, and this is an interesting verse here, set of verses, because this is somebody that believed and then switched over, got involved in a, in a different kind of system. They got confused. We have that a lot today. There's a lot of believers that have switched over into, you need to ask them, how did you receive the Spirit? Did you receive it by being a good person, or did you receive it by faith? That's a good conversation to have. Well, you know, they kind of work around that. I've still got to do that. I, yeah, I received it through faith, but I have to be a good person. Oh, whoa. See how they try to mingle that again? They're trying to mingle it. They're trying to make that requirement before the faith. You can't do it. You can't do it. So you can see that why he's, he's doing this is because religion says that you receive the Spirit by your initiation. It's by something that you did or will do or will become to receive the Spirit. It's not by our initiation, it's by what God has already done. The only thing that bridges the gap, if you want to look at initiation, is faith. Faith. And I can't claim that's doing anything. I can say that's believing, but like we've talked about many times, that's non-meritorious, right? So that's a good place to stop. But uh, let me just read this last verse, but Paul continues to get on them. Verse 3, Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? See what they were doing? They started out good. They were, they were in the Spirit, filled with the Spirit, being perfected in the Spirit, and then they switched over to a works-based system. So, like I said, that has effects. 
bad effects. They're going to show up at the judgment seat with nothing to show for if they keep trying to be perfected in the flesh. That's what everybody's doing nowadays. There's no divine good, human good. There's no, none of that in a conversation of a religious church. There's just good. That's it. But guess what? They're being perfected in the flesh. There's no conversation about motivation when it comes to doing good. It's just about doing the good. We don't care how you do it. No, God sees the heart. And He has a requirement on how we do things. So, that's where I guess we'll pick up next time. But uh, amazing things that Paul's telling us here. These are all good, good verses to keep in mind because, you know, it seems like when you see them, you know them, you understand them. And then when you see them again, it just, new things fall out. I mean, that's the word, right? It's exciting because new things just pop out. Like, where did that come from? Wait a minute. It was always there. Just, you know, now, now it's something different. Uh, not the meaning. <laughs> so God is good. So let's, uh, let's go ahead and pray, and we'll come back this weekend and do it again. Dear Father, we just thank you so much for your word. Thank you for just the freeness of God's grace, of your grace to just provide, to love, and provide salvation through your Son, Jesus Christ. Uh, not only did you love us, but you provided our salvation, and you turned around and said, simply believe. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. And I'm so grateful for that gift, because we want to preach the good news. We don't want to preach a different news, or another news, or a bad news. We want to preach news that's good. And the only news that's good is news that we are saved through believing in what you have already done. I thank you so much. Thank you for the ability to believe in the name of Christ. And thank you for just this life to be able to enjoy it through you. We ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen.